as an outage. Sure. I think the largest thing that we see is usually a service outage, so whether that's utility power or, you know, an Internet connection. Um, and that can be something at the service provider level or even, you know, like road construction where a fiber line gets cut by a backhoe or something like that where, you know, you then need to fail over your infrastructure over to another provider. So at the service provider level, we're able to build in a lot of redundancies with different WAN carriers, uh, different, um, you know, levels of networking gear redundancy, uh, but a lot of smaller companies aren't able to kind of get that same uh, type of high availability. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, I had heard a story from another um, a customer, actually, someone had sawed through power lines. They were underground, and they were, you know, like eight inches in diameter, and that's what caused their data center outage. So it's interesting that, you know, a backhoe can do the same kind of damage. Pat, what is, uh, what do you see for, uh, things that cause outages for your customer or in other IT experience? Yeah, we see um, everything that everyone's mentioned so far. Um, we've also helped people deal with big events like Hurricane Sandy. But uh, the one that breaks my heart is storage corruption. So we look at those hardware failures, and with virtualization and high availability, most people are today are able to architect around you know, a motherboard or single compute instance failure, things like that. But when you see an entire array get corrupted uh, due to a firmware upgrade gone bad or something wrong with an I.O. controller where it just sprays garbage across the array, um, there's really not an effective way to recover that without having some sort of service because usually you, need, you can go to your backup environment and if your backups are good, you want to restore all that data somewhere, um, but usually that array that just got corrupted uh, is where you would have normally gone to restore it, and because it's in question, the last thing you want to do is put data back. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone. I lost Pat there for a second. Okay. So. Dan, why don't you talk about things that you've seen in your environment that can cause an issue? Sure. I think, you know, it, it's a pretty good spread that you've got up here. I think hardware failures are definitely the one we see, you know, most often. I think that's just because, like you said, right, everyone's got hardware. It's, it's likely to go at some point, and uh, usually it's always at the most inopportune moment. Um, you know, kind of touching a little bit more on what David said earlier, the change control processes that some of these customers have, you know, whether they have them and they're not really following them so much or maybe they don't have them at all. So, you know, kind of the, the human error side of the uh, infrastructure management locally can sometimes cause a lot of those issues. And then, uh, again, you know, Pat kind of touched on Hurricane Sandy. We've seen, you know, kind of disaster recovery being used as disaster prevention where you kind of preemptively fail um, because you're expecting something bad to happen. I mean, you know, hurricanes, right, you know they're coming, which, of course, is, is a minority of actual disasters, big big natural disasters we all like to talk about as the scary things. But some of those you know they're coming, and you can do things preventatively to actually, instead of worrying about recovering, you're, you're doing it pre preventatively. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we have seen customers, they actually have, they have one data center located where their headquarters is, which happens to be in the hurricane zone, and then they have their secondary site um, out really far away, so they do migrations between the two sites. So when hurricane season, hurricane season comes, they move completely away from the shore. Bill, what was your top scary outage that you saw from your customers? Well, scary would probably be um, fire. You know, we've seen a lot of, you know, what's up here and what people have talked about. The disaster avoidance was a really good point, I think. You know, people that are forward thinking and, and looking at this from a mature standpoint are, are looking at disaster avoidance. But, um, you know, there's those things that you just can't, there's no way you could possibly see coming. We had a, a company that, that was a client of ours in, you know, some capacity. They were doing some hybrid cloud services, and they actually had a, a fire in the building directly next to where their data room was, and it was had no, you know, nothing to do with them. It was some construction that went bad, and you know, all of a sudden, it was it was a really bad scene for them. 
luckily they didn't lose anything, but you know it was really a compelling moment for them to go, wow, you know it's t it's time to grow up and stop doing this on our own. We need to you know get a more mature solution, and and they're actually a, a Zerto customer. Yeah, wow. Interestingly enough, um, you know I don't when we talk about disasters, kind of as Dan mentioned, we talk about hurricanes and things like that, weather, but not other other kinds of disasters that aren't weather made in addition to kind of the stuff you see up on the slide that you know everyone has every day. Hmm, interesting. Okay. So one thing also that we hear a little bit about is people are like, oh we don't get disasters that often. We don't have outages or things like that. But again from our survey we found that actually half of people had to use their DR events in some sort of way. So 40% of companies had had a major outage in the last 12 months. And then from those outages, you know, companies can recover, but not so fast. So 70, 77% of businesses were at least fairly confident that they could recover. But if you look at, you know, one day, multiple days a week or more, you know, the perception of recovery is, you know, quite a bit longer. People think, oh, I can be up and running in an hour. But then we got into what that really looked like. The perception was not exactly matching with reality. And Dan, you had talked about that on Tuesday, the perception of the recovery. So what do you, you know, what do you think people, what's happening, what are people seeing, and what's causing that discrepancy? I think, um, you know, most people tend to be optimists when they're talking about their capabilities. And so unless you're actually testing your disaster recovery plan, you probably really don't have a good idea of all the little things that are going to come up along the way. And I think we've all probably seen this, you know, in the, the many number of disaster recovery exercises we've been through. But, you know, you, if you, if you kind of think through, well, if this were to happen, here's what we would do, right? You go through the processes and you give kind of best case answers for everything in terms of timelines. And you say, all right, I could be up in a day and then uh, you know when you when you find out in, in the real world once you're doing it you know under the gun with, with certain pressures and maybe things that aren't working as you expected because of the disaster or, or not because of uh, things tend to take longer right and I think that's that's kind of the, the norm across the industry as a whole in IT most things tend to take longer than you dream up in your head and so I think uh, that's why that word perception I think is very important around this because unless you're actually testing and can uh, can say hey we've gone through this process and this is how long it took us then you really don't know and it's it's really just a guess at that point yeah I think that's a great point Josh you're really hands-on in terms of designing and implementing these types of DR solutions um, do you find that you during the implementation do you do a test run and are people surprised you know because it took so long or surprised because it didn't take as long as they thought so people are usually surprised at how quick uh, you know it is to bring back an infrastructure from uh, a replication standpoint. Uh, I think what surprises a lot of people, and I kind of like how you put up there when you said not so fast, is the total time it takes to recovery. It's not just how long it takes to recover the servers, but you know allow your users to get back in and up and running. And what a lot of people don't consider is uh, your application may not be designed to operate right away out of a um, recovery environment. Do you have to update DNS records? Do you have to change IP addresses? Do you have to repoint your customers to a new location where they can resume their work? So that's one of the reasons we really like doing a uh, testing from start to finish so people can you know, kind of find out those little intricacies. Okay, great. Um, let's see if there's anyone else. I want to pull in on the question. Hey, Jennifer, David. Bill. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was just no, jumping ahead, in. <laughs> sorry. I, I think you know this and one other thing that I found that customers tend to, to forget during the DR, you know, even when they do practicing and, and you know go through the run books and validate connectivity and all that, the other thing is these things don't happen when everybody's around and ready for them to happen. And so the DR practice and the DR, you know, everybody, you know, being on the same page, everybody's in the room, we're ready, we're gonna go through our our practice DR, it, that's not really what happens. It's usually, you know, it's a fr Friday night or it's, it's you know, Sunday morning and, you know, so and so is on vacation and he's the only guy who knows how to get into our uh, DNS registrar. I mean, there's, 
a lot of things that kind of go sideways during a real DR. And so, you know, I think that's one of the other things that people tend to forget about accounting for. They say, you know, we've gone through the prop process, everybody understands it, but are those people all going to be there? You know, is there going to be any time associated with, you know, getting those people in place? And so those are, you know, there's, there's a lot to DR. I mean, it's not just a technology solution, it's a people solution too. Yeah, that's actually a great point. Um, one of our customers uh, local in Boston, he did a webinar for us in October with the scary DR stories. And kind of exactly that scenario happened. So a block in Boston, his, his business was located in Boston, lost power. And one of the guys was on vacation. And their DR plan was see six people on a conference call. And one of them was missing. And so they were kind of like, well, we think we does this next. But it wasn't, you know, it, it, there's knowledge in people as well, and you have to say you make sure it's either documented very well or duplicated. Yeah, and I think that's you know when you look at something like Zerto, I mean that's why you know orchestrating as much as humanly possible or technologically possible is is really important. You know, having as much of that automated, you know, is really key. And then you know you just have to make sure you account for the human factor of it, it's not always going to be you know Monday morning at nine when everybody's happy and ready to roll, it's it's usually at a bad time <laughs> that nobody's expecting. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, David, in terms of the perception of recovery, do you find that people are surprised and, and why so? Yeah, I, I think there's two pieces to that. One is they're surprised how long it takes them when they're doing it themselves. And then I think they're surprised that there's actually technology and process out there that they could use to improve what they're doing. It's never as, um, as each of the other speakers were talking about, it's never as smooth or as quick as com or co as convenient as you would like. But the thing that we find most often happens, in addition to the right person not being available or the, the run books not being where they uh, can be reached, is that the environments that people are running change on a regular basis. And when they change, uh, it's not foremost in people's minds to go back and update the run books and retest those environments. And so they find oftentimes that while the run book may have been accurate a couple of months ago when they were running the test, a lot has changed since. And they get into the middle of the implementation and, and suddenly they're stuck. And I, I think tools like Zerto help get around some of those issues but there's still a latent knowledge that people have that, that you have to add into that equation as well. Okay, great. And Pat, last but certainly not least, how do you find yeah, people are surprised? Yeah, you guys hear me right now? Very well. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that earlier. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, I'll kind of pile on to what Dave was saying. It, it's not just the run book. It's the um, usually people that are maintaining their, their DR environments aren't upgrading their DR environment in parity with production. So if you have I.O. contention issues or you add a flash-based storage array to your environment to solve some database performance, um, you're probably still replicating a copy of that database or that application to the DR site, but it's really hard to cost justify, you know, adding another, you know, basically 200% investment every time you upgrade production, upgrade DR. And, and so when we see people fail over, they're able to bring the applications up, but they can't stand them up at the performance level. They had a production, so for all intents and purposes, to the users or the clients, uh, they might as well be down. I want to make one other comment, too, on the availability of people. We s tend to see that other infrastructure fails around people when there's an event. So the idea that um, you know there might be people you know, injured or distracted by the scale of the event that's occurring, uh, cellular service, you know, you, you imagine that you can log into your laptop and start logging into these control panels and pushing buttons, um, but that doesn't work if your your machine's not with you or the, the cell towers are too congested to get a good signal. There's all sorts of, uh, you heard a lot, but there's just so many things that crop up. Um, we actually try to uh, set the run books up so that we can run as many of the steps as possible so someone can call us and say, hey, I'm not going to be able to get the control panel for you know 30 minutes or a few hours can you guys go ahead and start warming up the environment for me yeah great that's a great point okay so I we have a couple of questions all of which I can answer 
the one, are, are we stuck on slide seven? No, we're not stuck on slide seven. Um, the goal of this webinar mostly is the discussion. So you'll see that I have you know slides up there just to have something that you know everyone can kind of look at. And then is the webinar being recorded? It is, but I did miss the first two minutes, so I apologize. But it is being recorded, and we'll have that available on our website. So we talk about so we've talked about you know various scenarios, what causes an outage, and you know when you have to recover. You know, what does that look like? And then how can we achieve business continuity and disaster recovery? So there are many ways that you can do this. So the first kind of most typical is private cloud, business continuity and disaster recovery. Um, you have site A, you have site B, do replication between them. You know, obviously a little bit more on um, the pricey side, depending on your economies of scale. So if you have a very, very large company, this might make sense. If you're on the smaller side, you know, maintaining a dedicated DR site, um, can be challenging from a cost perspective. So then we have a cloud provider, and you can do something that we call Disaster Recovery as a Service, or DRAS. Um, although I do hear I have a couple of the, our panelists, I believe Dan calls it DRAS. Um, so that's when you have your production site, and then you can do Disaster Recovery to a cloud provider site. For those applications that you just don't like, and I know all of you are thinking of exactly the one that you don't like. Um, you can do replication. You can give the production site to the cloud provider and then also let them do disaster recovery as well. And that way you don't have to worry about the application at all. You can just dial in and access it. And we call that in-cloud uh, BCDR. And then another interesting use case is reverse disaster recovery as a service. So cloud providers tend to refresh their environment a little faster than everybody else because they want to be able to offer the latest, greatest, shiny, brand new services to all of you. So for the production environment, you might want to have that for your production everyday mode of operation. And then they'll maintain their slightly older hardware at their own site to do disaster recovery as a service. And then something that we're seeing more and more of is cross-cloud provider BCDR. Um, so this is the ability to do disaster recovery between Zerto Cloud Ecosystem cloud providers. So, and Pat, you had brought this up as a use case in particular. So I wonder if you would like to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, what's interesting is we're, um, so every, every, all the panelists that are on the phone today obviously have a pretty modern DR solution. Uh, but if you look back across, you know, the hosting industry, it's been around for, you know, at least a decade, if not two. So not everybody has a as a service based recovery solution. So if you look at some more traditional hosting providers, they're still rack and stack models, and uh, they don't have a way to do, uh, you know, that middle diagram where you go from data center A to A to data center B. Or they do, but it's array based replication. It doesn't have all the elegance around the control. And, um, precedence of when you boot machines up and the simplicity, and it's probably not an as-a-service model. You're probably paying 100% in both places. So what we're seeing is people that are in more of a classic colo environment are looking at, hey, I'm in provider A. Can I go to an as-a-service for uh, provider B? Did we lose Pat? Bill, um, you had mentioned reverse. Oh, Pat, are you back? OK. So Bill, you had mentioned reverse disaster recovery service as being something that you're seeing a little bit more of. Um, can you comment on that a bit? Yeah, I think it you know goes to what you were saying. It, I think you know initially when we started doing DR as a service, um, Particularly with Zerto, we, th we thought maybe reverse DR as a service would be m more of a corner case type solution where, you know, occasionally we get somebody that might want that, but nine times out of ten we were going to be looking at DR as a service from a customer into us or from, you know, within our data center network. So from location to location, just, you know, regional uh, geodiversity type um, solutions. And what we found, I mean, pretty quick actually, it was one of our very first uh, Zerto customers was that you know, they didn't want 
they had a pretty decent data center. What their problem was is they were they're down in the south and they're a large manufacturing facility and they just had terrible um, issues with connectivity. And so it wasn't so much power cooling and all the normal stuff that a you know on-prem computer room would deal with. The, these guys had a decent data center. They just couldn't get good um, connectivity from their you know bandwidth providers. So they decided you know really kind of early on that they wanted to move to the cloud. They knew that they had to get things out of there because they couldn't they couldn't afford to have their business have any downtime at all um, being manufacturers. So what but they wanted to do. Um, you know, to take advantage of the, the, the existing footprint that they put some money into is to protect back to their site so that, you know, just in the case that, you know, there was some issue at the production cloud site that they could, you know, fail over. And, and they've actually, you know, since they started doing that, they, you know, they've gotten a lot more life out of some older gear, which, you know, you, you hit on. And I think that that's really nice. I mean, you know, instead of, um, you know, paying for a second site in terms of DR, um, they can extend the life cycle of some older gear, maybe drop maintenance on it. And, you know, the other thing is they've been able to use it as a data migration tool. So Zerto is very flexible with moving, you know, stuff from point A to point B. So they've been able to do some test dev build outs, move them to us via Zerto, and then protect them back. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty creative tool once you start seeing all the different facets to, you know, how it can protect from site A to site B in, in this case. Okay, great. So we did get um, a question around AWS. So in this webinar, we're actually not going to be talking about that. However, I will plug our next webinar, which is on March 17th at 1 p.m. And you can go to our website to register. And that's where we'll be covering the Zerto Virtual Application 4.0 features. So if you want to hear more about AWS or more about Hyper-V support, Please register and uh, join that webinar. Um, okay, so is anyone? Um, let me see. Sorry, I just lost my next question. Here we go. So to Dan. So Dan, do you see customers doing in-cloud BCDR, or is it mostly DRAS? Are they how comfortable do you think customers are with just taking that application that they don't like and just handing it over? <laughs> Well, I think um, you know we see a lot of both. So obviously the the the, the DRAS, right, as I call it, um, of actually <laughs> customer site to us is kind of um, like the first baby step for a lot of customers in terms of how how they're getting to start adopting the cloud, right? Because it, it does make a lot of sense. Obviously, you get into that site B and leveraging uh, shared infrastructure on the back end. And so you know once somebody kind of takes the next step and they they put something in production. Um, they do have a couple options, right? You can do the reverse replication, as we talked about, or you can do in cloud between sites. And you know, most of us here have multiple data centers, so that becomes an option. And just kind of take that whole load off the customer, and they still have the ability to to test it. They still get to do all the run books. It's just like you know, from their site to ours, all the all the great stuff about Zerto. Um, and so I think we're starting to see more and more of the in cloud as businesses are moving to kind of that cloud first. Um, and, and getting off of their premise. Um, and even then it could be from things like like more of a hosted private cloud to um, DR at another site on more of a you know multi-tenant public environment. Um, I think that, that kind of speaks to the, really the flexibility of the, the, the Zerto software. I mean, look at all the things we, we have on this slide, all the different arrows going everywhere, and all the ways you can use the software. And we're still probably not even talking about half of the different ways we all use this. So. Um, I think that's you know really one of the best parts of, of how we're able to use this to provide services to customers. Okay, great. Um, Josh Larson, someone is asking a question, and what is the largest database that we've handled in DRAS? So I don't know if you have that. I know that's a very specific question. I hope I'm not putting you too much on the spot. <laughs> No, you're fine. Um, the largest database in question, I mean, obviously with Zerto, we're talking about, you know, um, the database server. Um, we have, you know, replicated entire Oracle uh, database servers. And Oracle, when you're talking DR or even replication, um, you know, can be a very touchy subject. We've replicated servers up into the hundreds of gigabytes. Okay, great. And then uh, David Fowler, someone is asking a question. It's, how large do the network connections need to be between cloud providers for DR? 
So I can just chime yeah. in and say, oh, go ahead. No, David, you go. I was just going to say, it, it, it really, I hate to, to give the it depends answer, but it really does depend on the volume of data and how fast you want to be back up or how often you're doing your uh, replication. Uh, so in a lot of cases, uh, between our dentist data centers, we use uh, 10 gigabit lines uh, for exactly that reason, so that we can handle the kind of volume that you get when you have a large number of customers who are trying to replicate data on a regular basis. Um, when you go between a cloud and a customer site, it tends to be uh, a little more difficult because the, the customer wants to control what the uh, linkage might be between the two. And then on top of that, uh, you've got to be able to uh, handle whatever the speed is that they need in order to get the data replicated in, in the right time frame. So uh, you know, back to it depends. Uh, and most organizations have calculators, and they can figure it out pretty quickly once they know how, what, the, what the RPO rates are. OK, great. Let's move into some of the questions that we hear all the time around um, disaster recovery as a service. So this one, actually, I think we've answered pretty thoroughly in terms of what the typical cause of an outage is for a customer. So I am actually going to move on from this. If any of the panelists want to put in the chat window if they'd like to add one more thing, that's fine. Um, but here is one that I don't think we've touched on too much. And that is, how do you know if your disaster recovery solution is good enough for your applications, your business, and your environment? So Pat, we'll try you, see if we can hear you. All right, how do I sound now? Great. OK, thank God. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is, this is a really challenging question because, as you can probably imagine, the answer within the business uh, varies quite a bit. So IT tends to have one understanding. It's usually based on uh, orders that they were given five years ago, and they're still executing based on that. So you know, having a tape off site or replicating to a cold site still seems good enough. Uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, what we're seeing is businesses, uh, the business units who are increasingly adopting SaaS applications, whether it's Salesforce or Marketo or Workday are getting used to these really insane levels of uptime and um, fairly non, you know, disaster events occur and nothing happens. And then the users, because they're using things like Office 365, Dropbox, Google, again, their perception of what uptime is is going up quite a bit. So what we're observing is a really big gap in like a lack of a solid conversation between IT and the business about what good enough actually means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Getting those two teams together is really important. Um, David, in your environment, you know, how do you, or with your customers, how do you help them evaluate DR is good enough, or what do you see them doing to evaluate disaster recovery? Yeah, the, the first question we end up having with them is uh, around what their expectations are. And they're, usually their expectations are much bigger than their budget. And so part of the discussion is mitigating for them uh, the cost versus the functionality they, they're looking for. And the, and the two key questions that we ask on the functionality side is, how long can you afford to be down? And how much data can you afford to lose? The, the first being how long it takes to get you back up and running. And the second being how often you need to checkpoint the data. So uh, on those two topics, uh, once we have a read from them, and, and I like Pat's comment about the business versus the IT department, because usually there's a discussion that takes place there where the business is much more aggressive than the IT department. But uh, once you have that data, then you can start to talk about costs associated with that and what the realities are of their environment. And that usually leads to a discussion about what I'll consider more reasonable guidelines that they're willing to live with. Yeah, so I think I, was, I laughed a little bit when you said their expectations and their budget doesn't match, because that's kind of true of all of us. <laughs> we go in to buy anything, and then we're like, oh, we have these expectations. But our, then we look at our budget, we have to reevaluate. 
Um, Amen on that. That's right. <laughs> Whether you know, no matter what it is. Bill, can you talk a little bit about you know what you do with your customers um, in terms of good enough and what they're looking for? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Pat's point was really, you know, kind of key. It's, um, you know, a lot of times we end up talking to, you know, the IT department or some re form of representation of the IT department. And, you know, I think, you know, any type of DR starts with this one question, you know, what are you trying to protect against? And, you know, what everybody else said is what is an acceptable protection? Meaning, you know, what is, you know, what, downtime is acceptable, what data loss is acceptable, and you know, the problem is 99% of the businesses out there, the first response they're going to get from the business owner is no downtime and no data loss, right? Everybody wants perfection. So you work backwards from there and you, know, are, you, know, you can have fast and you know, really great you know, protection, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. There's some, something's got to give somewhere, so you know, Kind of have to find that sweet spot, and you you also have to look at you know maybe prioritizing things. And I think that's this is you know a, a difficult conversation for a lot of IT departments to have because they often are kind of thrust into this position of making decisions on behalf of the business, and it may, it puts them at risk, you know. And so they don't they a lot of times they just avoid it and they don't <laughs> do what they're supposed to do. Um, but the good ones they're proactive, you know. They try to. Um, you know, have those hard conversations, and then they, you know, start tiering applications. They start, you know, saying, all right, maybe it's not an all or nothing. Maybe it's not an all replication or, you know, nothing at all. It's it, it's probably a blend of a lot of different, you know, SLAs. And, and so, you know, replication into a, a second site fits in there, you know, off-site backups, you know, near-line backups, all that stuff fits in there. Um, but you know, it's it's really just it starts against you know what is the likelihood that you're going to have a disaster, and that goes back to what we started this conversation with. You know, like what are your what are your fear factors? You know, are you worried about weather? Are you worried about you know power? Do you have connectivity issues? You know, or do you just want you know, oh my gosh, in case of 747 crashed into our building, we have to you know have something. Um, and once you define that, then you know you just go on to the next process, and that's really Okay, so that's what we're protecting against. Now, how is the best way to protect against that with the money and the tools that we have at our disposal? So, it's a, it's not, it's actually, you know, a lot of times DR is much more complicated than talking about a new production system, um, because it's something that it's, it's an insurance policy, and nobody likes to pay for insurance, and you know, because it, it almost feels like you're paying for something twice, and and so it's, it's, it, a lot of times it's a difficult conversation, but. You know, the tools are there. It's just a matter of figuring out the best way to use them. Yeah, Bill, this is Pat. I think you hit on something really key, and that is the perception that we're protected or that we, we think it's working, and IT knows that it's not. And I, I hope we don't get into a situation where we have the concept of a DR whistleblower evolve, but I, I can see as right. more pressure gets on IT and that perception grows and the ability to recover the way the business expects starts to erode, that IT almost needs a direct line. You know, that IT director, IT admin that knows the truth needs a direct line to the CEO because I guarantee that the CEO is not fully aware of how bad it could be if there was an event and they believe because they have a backup or whatever that things are going to be just fine because that's what they've been told. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, I think there's this avoidance, you know, maybe in a lot of IT departments, and you know, I think you're right because they're they're worried that they're going to bring up a conversation that involves spending more money, but then they're also going to raise a bunch of questions like, why are I thought we were already doing this, or you know, what you know, what is it going to take to do this and this and this, and and you know, it it becomes a very you know complicated can of worms, but you know. It, it's something that has to happen. I mean, does not to do any of these, you know, there, how many different statistics do we have out there that say, you know, any kind of measurable downtime can put a business, you know, under and force them to close doors. And so, you know, DR is not really an option. Um, we're far too reliant on all these systems, and everybody knows that. So, you know, you have to have some sort of uh, mitigation strategy, and, and that's, you know, that's why we're on the call. Yeah, great, great discussion. 
So I move on to the next question and talk about critical components of a disaster recovery solution. So Josh, in your vast experience of designing DR solutions, you know, what, what are the critical components? And especially if you could highlight ones that people tend to forget. Oh, sure, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to touch on. So the obvious areas are obviously you know, the technical components to it, getting data from A to B uh, in a timely fashion and setting it up in a way that you can restore the data and continue operations. Uh, one of the areas we see a lot of people have problems with is uh, kind of having a solution that is not feasible to manage. So we see a lot of fragmented environments where obviously people these days are, have you know, different components. They have web servers, database servers, um, you know, different um, internal systems running on different vendors, and they have a different DR solution kind of for each one. So maybe you're using Oracle Data Guard for one database server, SQL replication for another, um, or in SAN-based replication for a third. But as we were talking about earlier, you know, the DR never happens Monday morning at 9 o'clock when everyone's sitting at their desk. It could be at 2 in the morning. And when that happens, are you going to have to wake up you know, your, your Oracle DBA, your SQL DBA, your storage admin, your networking guys, and get them all you know, coordinated so you can get you know, your, your infrastructure back up and running? Um, and I think Zerto is really strong in, in that regard uh, in that it has you know, one nice simplified management console and that it integrates you know, with some of your virtual platforms anyways. So you know, theoretically, you could have one person that could manage your entire uh, DR recovery uh, from one standpoint, and also he can test it too. We don't have to coordinate all the time of all these different members to perform a test every month, every quarter, whatever it might be. Yeah, absolutely. And Dan, what would you add on to that? So, you know, I think um, for me, as, as much of a technologist as I am, I think that the biggest parts of a DR solution are the things that come before and after really the, the technology itself. I think really the most important thing is before you go down that path is doing the evaluation of what what you're trying to protect, right? Because you have to understand, right, the application landscape, the infrastructure at the source site, all the different dependencies, and, and taking that even to, to get into the people aspect of it. And so, so really understanding the work before implementing any technology, because, you know, it, in most cases, there's a lot of different things we have to, to put into the solution to ultimately bring out uh, the right answer for the customer. And then kind of the other side of that goes back to what we were talking about earlier is the testing side because that's the only way, you know, you really know whether, you know, it's quote unquote good enough. And even then you don't really know if it's good enough until you've gone through a disaster and come out the other side, right? Because that's that's the ultimate proof that, that you've done it good enough is that you've faced the disaster, you've come out successfully and everything, you know, continued to work either seamlessly or within the bounds of what your business has accepted as acceptable, right, acceptable downtime. So it's really the, the pre and post work to the solution. Um, and along with that testing is kind of that continual improvement, right? So things that come out of that test, what did you learn? And then how did you take what you learned and, and put that back into the solution and, and improve it for that next time? So you can either shorten your times or maybe you found it didn't work for, for one part of your system that, you know, might ultimately be you know, killing it all, um, but um, I think that's that's really for us. Um, really, what we want, what we need to look at is is you know, kind of understanding what they're trying to protect. Yeah, I'd underscore that with the idea of focus. So when I talk about the mission that IT has been on protecting the data center over the last five, ten years, it was usually a holistic strategy. In other words, protect the whole data center. But in most of the application tiering that you've heard us talk about where people rank applications, there's a clear pecking order to what it takes to keep the revenue coming in, keep the customers happy versus applications that are more of a, a convenience or an enabler. And if, that, if you're looking at a critical component, it's what do you really have to have at the end of the day? What really has to come back online? Because usually it's going to be just a handful of people trying to recover this, and the idea that you can bring two or 300 applications back online all at the same time is probably not realistic when you take what the folks have been saying about the front end, the back end, and all the adjacent information around powering up the VMs. Okay, great. And so, Bill, a question came in kind of relevant to this discussion. Um, so someone said, should your DR solution be designed for just a temporary solution so you have your production site back up? Or can it be seen just as a good 
and primary site and then becoming cold. So what are the typical scenarios that people that you're seeing around this? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that goes back to something I said earlier. It's like, you know, what what are you protecting against? You know, what is what what do you think your likely disaster could be um, that you would implement um, your recovery plan? And so, if it's a you know, if it's a hurricane, that's you know, or earthquake zone or something, you know, that's pretty you know high factor of, of catastrophe. You know, obviously, you're going to want to plan for a longer period of runtime. Um, the other thing is, you know, I think you have to look at what, um, you know, what, you know, we've talked about what you're protecting. And so if you're protecting a subset of applications and, you know, if they're just the critical apps, you know, maybe you're not going to be able to just get by with that for much more than a day or two and, you know, the business is going to need everything else up and running. So, you know, it's a, it's a complex question. I mean, I think it's really, it's driven by what you're trying to protect against and what the likelihood of an extended outage. If it's, you know, bandwidth, you know, you know your internet connection might go down periodically or, you know, the, the data center you're in has, you know, some power reliability issues every, you know, I don't know, six months or a year, then, you know, you can plan for, you know, just a short, you know, downtime. But we've got customers that, you know, have some pretty <laughs> high likelihoods of pretty major disasters, meaning, you know, they may be in, you know, the, the islands and, you know, hurricanes could come through and the storm might be gone, but connectivity or power could be gone for much longer than that. You know, I think it's, it, that's more of a situation where you have to look at including some, some apps that maybe somebody else wouldn't include, you know, just the, the bare essentials. And so, you know, it, it just kind of goes back to what are you protecting against and, and what do you feel like you need to have, you know, in terms of covering against that, that likelihood. Yeah. David, how about where you are? What are you seeing? Do you see it? Is it kind of, um, yeah, they are looking for a long period of time? Is it short? Is it both? It, it's mostly uh, for as long as it takes for them to get back to a stable environment that they had originally. And so, there's not a rush to fail back as long as they have the production environment that they need up and running. And, and to a lot of the points that were made earlier, uh, prioritizing what they need to have running versus what they would like to have running uh, is a big part of that planning up front. The other aspect um, that we run into is just understanding how much of the responsibility they want to take on themselves and how much they want the partner to take on when there is a, a failure. Now we have um, organizations we talk to that they're interested in us doing the failover for them, but they want to do the fail back themselves. And that gives them the flexibility to decide when they're going to do the fail back and how much of their environment they actually want to fail back to. OK. Great. Let's see. I'm Moving on to the last question. So, how do people get started? So that's always, you know, kind of the, like it's it's funny. I feel like people think DR is this large, overwhelming thing, but you know, to paraphrase an expression from a previous manager, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So, David, why don't we we'll start with you again on this question? So, when people want to get started, what do they get to do? Uh, we always say the first thing is, and this goes back to our earlier discussions, uh, make an inventory of what you actually uh, can live with, what you actually need, and what you can live without. And then use that as a basis for doing your planning. Uh, that then leads to the discussion around uh, the how much data you can afford to lose and how fast you need to be up and running, and then how much budget you have. And then from there, the conversation goes directly into uh, design, so helping the organization figure out how the implementation is actually going to take place and, and then getting those run books in place. And, and to my earlier point, figuring out who's going to do what in the process so that there is no confusion about when something gets initiated and how it gets initiated. Yeah, that's great. Um, so we're going to continue this with this question, but I'm going to put a poll up for all our participants to uh, con to if you could just take it. So I'm going to put that up one second. But Bill, if you could, you know, how do you think people need to get started? What's the best first step? Yeah, I think uh, you know that's a good point. I, I think getting started is 
actually really easy. I mean, I think you can get um, you can get you know Zerto installed and you know the site's connected and you know the VPN set up and all that good stuff um, fairly quickly. We do that all the time. I think you know the the heavier lifting is okay. What did what did we really achieve here? You know, the technology is really easy to use. It's very approachable. It's very intuitive, and getting data from point A to point B. Is you know, it's a basic uh, mechanism. So I think, you know, it's starting with quantifying where you where where are your most critical um, applications. You know, is it you know an application server, SQL server, you know, shared SQL server, or whatever. Um, start defining those requirements. Um, you know, draw up a quick sizing, and you know, obviously. Any type of DR is going to be a uh, you know there's going to have, be have have to be some ca calculation of you know change rate and and um, available bandwidth and things like that. So you can't just say all right we're going to dump you know all 300 VMs into this 10 meg pipe. It's probably not going to work out so well. You have to figure out okay we've defined what we want to protect. What does it look like and what are the burdens of of you know bandwidth to get it from point A to point B and then start you know going from there. Um, the other stuff. Is is that's business process stuff that is no you know nobody in IT likes to do that stuff unfortunately you know, runbooks are I don't think they're on anybody's uh, <laughs> short list of things they want to do but you know it's something that you have to do and so then um, but getting started is pretty easy I think it's really just the next the next evolution of it is all right let's test this thing let's figure out where the the gaps are what where where do we fall apart? What do we forget? What you know? Oh gosh, we didn't think about that person works remotely. They need a VPN client instead of the site to site and all that good stuff. You know, there's always those little nuances to it, and that, and that never goes away. But um, starting the the DR protection is really just a matter of quantifying quantifying the 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 problem and you know starting work to work toward the solution. And you know, it could be as little as just you know, a handful of servers. It could be as as many as several hundred. It's it really depends on the organization. Okay, great. Oh, and quickly on the poll, so you can select more than one if you want more than one of our uh, participant companies to follow up with you today. So just note that. And then, so related to this topic, uh, Dan, something that came in: Does your organization typically help out with business continuity planning, or do the customer do do this on their own? So. So most of the time, we're helping, right? Because I think uh, between us and our, our partner network, there's a, there's a lot of services around disaster recovery planning that you know customers just just aren't really prepared to do themselves. Don't have really the best processes, and you know probably haven't gone through it as many times um, as as we have. And and so it's really that that evaluation on the front side of uh, you know kind of kind of what they're up against that we can help them and walk them through. Uh, and then, really, to go to that earlier point, it's it's exactly what you said. It's you know starting small and picking some critical applications to go with first. Uh, we generally see a lot of expansion once people start small because they realize just how easy um, this can get. Um, so I really just wanted to add that point in on the last topic. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to say yeah, I would with that. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to say I'm going to give you just a few more seconds on the poll because I'm going to move to contact email so everyone can get them. And I'm sorry I interrupted David, I believe. No, it was Bill. I, I was just going to say okay. I, I completely agree with that last point. We we definitely see once people get up and comfortable with, you know, the most basics and essentials that next thing I know there's NASs and, and drives flying into the data center with more data. And they're going, all right, we need to get this going and, and you know, really accelerate. And so it's kind of cool because you can see the, the evolution of maturity um, not just in the, the technology, but then the business themselves, they can see, uh, you know, kind of the light turns on, if you will, and they go, oh, man, we could really do a lot of cool things with this. And and so, yeah, definitely, it, it starts small, get comfortable, you know, get some practice, and then, you know, go from there. Okay, great. So, Josh, how would you get started on planning? So I, you know, I, I agree with everyone here. I think we're all on the same page. The first thing, you know, you really need to do is identify what you need in house for DR. You know, everyone would like to be able to say, you know, hey, everything I have set up here, let's make that available here. Um, but you know, we all agree that when it comes down to cost, bandwidth, some of those um, 
fees in there that you want to identify uh, what's important, what order it needs to be available in, um, can some of this run at a subset of you know, its production level resources, um, and then start to define what your requirements are, what are your RPO, RTO times. Um, once you know that, you know, we can help um, put together a solution, we can start asking the questions. Sometimes we have people that walk in and they say, you know, I need all this available and I need it you know, uh, this quickly. And I say, well, have you considered this, have you considered that? And once we start asking some of the questions, a lot of the things we talked about today, uh, especially when it comes down to the planning, we find out that people just you know, don't necessarily have a plan put together. So after all the technical requirements are done, um, that's our next step. Who's going to be doing the failover? Uh, you know, are, are we uh, going to be assisting with your business continuity? Um, and do you have the resources on your side to you know, make all the changes happen? Yeah, Mrs. Pat, the final thought I would add is that um, you know, I agree. This is not some. Some of these things are not people get, get things that people get really excited about. But it is if you sort of change your perspective on what you're actually doing, and you look at this as building a hybrid cloud architecture, or to some degree doing some DevOps, um, it, it really is a wonderful way to try cloud and actually reduce the risk inside of your business. Versus the idea, you know, maybe five years ago, we're trying cloud meant putting an application that you care and fed for for years inside your data center out into this other person's data center that you don't know. So what we're seeing is a lot of people's skill sets are getting stretched. They're using uh, virtualization technology, Zerto, things like that that they haven't used before. They're dealing with wide area network issues, security issues, and sort of at their pace versus being forced into it, which is what a lot of people feel like cloud, cloud means. Okay, great. So I'm going to squeeze in two questions really quick. Um, so we'll go with Bill. Someone's asking about where do you draw the line between disaster recovery as a service and going active-active or live-live. So what do you think is the use, difference in use cases there? Um, you know, that's, that's tough because, you know, disaster recovery as a service in the context that we've been talking about is, is Active passive, right? So it's it's really um, you know having a uh, somewhat warm standby copy of everything that's being replicated versus active active, which is you're serving live data out of both locations. And we actually have you know several customers that do both. You know they they have some criti critical applications that are being replicated and made highly available via you know proprietary application level um, replication, but then on the back end. Um, they've tiered some apps that are just being replicated via Zerto. Same, you know, customer environment, same network, just um, just a tiered level of criticality. And so I think it's really just a matter of what are you trying to achieve, and again, quantifying acceptable uh, downtime. So Active Active is really a very high level. Um, you know, we just can't have any downtime at all. So you know, online e-commerce e or anything having to do with public safety or anything like that. We've got a lot of those types of clients, and they do active-active, but then they may do active-passive, which is obviously less intense um, from a requirement standpoint for the, the lower tier apps. So it's really, you know, all goes back to quantifying what, you know, what the problem we're trying to solve is. And so, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways to do it. And we often see everybody does a combination of, of lots of different tiers. Great. So I'm going to make this the last question. I know we have a few here, but don't worry, we will follow up with you. And so to Dan, so someone's asking about testing strategies used because they would like to test without impacting production. So I think that's probably one of the, the best things that doing DR as a service, especially around the Zerto product, gives you is the ability to, to do the failover test in an isolated environment that doesn't impact production. Um, because that's, right, with, if you can get away without impacting production, you're going to be more likely to do your testing uh, and, get, and get through that whole process. So, so that's obviously really a big advantage to the, to the DR as a service offering. And I think we tend to see people who start doing that for testing start to use it for a lot of different other workloads, like sandbox testing, right? So you're not just doing a DR test, but maybe you're testing an application patch, going back to that, hey, let me avoid a disaster by bringing up my DR environment you know, making a big change there and then, you know, crossing my fingers and seeing if it breaks everything. And if it did, 
you know, no big deal. I just trash it because I didn't break my production environment. So I think that's uh, definitely a strong advantage of, uh, of the Zerto offering is that ability to do testing in a non-disruptive manner. Great. Thank you so much. So we are over time already, and I feel bad that I've kept all of our panelists a little bit over. But um, David, Pat, Josh, Dan, and Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. This was recorded, so we will post it on our site. So have a great day. And again, all our panelists, thank you very, very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.